has something of a shock to many. It seems to me that the most dubious premise in the foregoing argument is premise one. In order to understand why I say this, it will be helpful to take a backward glance at Isaac Newton's classical doctrine of absolute time and space, which was superseded by STR. The locus classicus of Newton's exposition of his concepts of time and space is the scolium to his definitions in the Principia Mathematica. In order to overcome what he called common prejudices concerning such quantities as time, space, place, and motion, Newton draws a dichotomy with respect to these quantities between absolute and relative, true and apparent, mathematical and common. With respect to time, he asserts, and I quote, absolute, true, and mathematical time of itself and from its own nature flows equally without relation to anything external and, by another name, is called duration. Relative, apparent, and common time is some sensible and external, whether accurate or unequal, measure of duration by the means of motion, which is commonly used instead of the true time, such as an hour, a day, a month, a year. The most evident feature of this distinction is the independence of absolute time from the relative measures thereof. Absolute time, or simple duration, exists regardless of the sensible and external measurements, which we try, more or less successively, to make of it. Excuse me. Newtonian time is thus, first of all, absolute in the sense that time itself is distinct from our measures of time. But Newton also conceived of time as absolute in yet a more profound sense. Namely, he held that time exists independently of any physical objects whatsoever. Usually, this is interpreted to mean that time would exist even if nothing else existed, that we can conceive of a logically possible world which is completely empty except for the container of absolute space and the flow of absolute time. But here we must be very careful. Modern secular scholars tend frequently to forget how ardent a theist Newton was and how central this theism played in his metaphysical outlook. In fact, Newton makes quite clear in the general scolium to the Principia, which he added in 1713, that absolute time and space are constituted by the divine attributes of eternity and omnipresence. He writes, God is eternal and infinite. That is, his duration reaches from eternity to eternity, his presence from infinity to infinity. He is not eternity and infinity, but eternal and infinite. He is not duration or space, but he endures and is present. He endures forever and is everywhere present. And by existing always and everywhere, he constitutes duration and space. Since every particle of space is always, and every indivisible moment of duration is everywhere, certainly the maker and lord of all things cannot be never and nowhere. Because God exists, there exists an everlasting duration. And because he is omnipresent, there exists an infinite space. Absolute time and space are therefore relational in that they are contingent upon the existence of God. In Newton's view, God's now is thus the present moment of absolute time. Since God is not, quote unquote, a dwarf God, 
located at a particular place in space, but is omnipresent, there is a worldwide moment which is absolutely present. Newton's temporal theism thus provides the foundation for absolute simultaneity. The absolute present and absolute simultaneity are features first and foremost of God's time, absolute time, and derivatively of measured or relative time. Thus, the classical Newtonian concept of time is firmly rooted in a theistic worldview. What Newton did not realize, nor could he have suspected, is that physical time is not only relative, but also relativistic. That the approximation of physical time to absolute time depends not merely upon the regularity of one's clock, but also upon its motion. Unless a clock were at absolute rest, it would not accurately register the passage of absolute time. Moving clocks run slowly. This truth, unknown to Newton, was finally grasped by physicists only with the advent of relativity theory. Where Newton fell short then was not in his analysis of absolute or metaphysical time. He had theological grounds for positing such a time, but in his incomplete understanding of relative or physical time. He assumed too readily that an ideal clock would give an accurate measure of time independently of its motion. If confronted with relativistic evidence, Newton would no doubt have welcomed this correction and seen therein no threat at all to his doctrine of absolute time. In short, relativity corrects Newton's concept of physical time, not his concept of absolute time. 